All right, everybody, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm super excited to um, have all of you join us today. I know I don't really get to see all of your faces, um, but we will be allowing you after um, after Mickey and Cohagen have their presentation, I will be um, allowing you all to speak. Um, so just be cognizant. Um, I know right now you um, don't have to worry about that mute button, but a little bit later, um, please, um, know that you, when you are done talking, to please go back ahead and mute yourself. Um, you can also use the chat function or the Q&A &A function. Um, and if you did not see my note and you have not gotten your lunch yet, um, you can use that Good Sense code. Um, it's YPG Cool, um, all capital letters online and on the app. You can use that all day long. So if you guys you didn't get to use it for lunch and you want to have some Good Sense later. Go right ahead and use that today. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to Mickey and Cohagen. We are so excited to hear from them today um, about the new climate plan. Great. Oh, thank you, Kayla. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for signing on today. There's so much to share with you, and I'll pull up a presentation here. Um, but I really appreciate your interest in this area. And I also want to invite you, if you have, um, after this presentation, more questions or just a curiosity about the plan itself and you want to dive a little deeper, please go to uh, lincoln.ne.gov and then keyword resilient um, to get to the plan. And there's also a feedback loop where you can submit comments. Those come directly to me and we can start engaging on any of the questions that you have. So I'm going to go ahead. I'll drop that information in the chat. And again, if you need to dive deeper into the plan itself and see it for yourself, you can get it at the city's website. All right, um, I'm gonna introduce Cohagen a little bit later because uh, he has really folded into the presentation today. But if you don't already know me, I um, wanted to introduce myself. I'm Mickey Esposito. I work as the LTU, the Tr Transportation and Utilities Director, here for the city for the last eight years. I resigned from that position and took sort of a, a leave. I went to Olson um, and worked as their marketing director for a year. And Mayor had put this wonderful opportunity in front of me. Um, <laughs> so I just couldn't resist and I had to come back. Um, my background is in biology and chemistry. That was my undergrad. And I went to law school for uh, natural resources and environmental law. And so my passion and love um, is really around environmental issues um, and uh, what my brothers would call being the toxic avenger. So I have three brothers and they're just insane, but um, they, I really am passionate about this area and I can't wait to share um, the initiative with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint here. And hopefully, Everyone is seeing a big circle uh, that says Resilient Lincoln. Um, so exciting to be working on this important initiative. And just, you know, that Mayor uh, Gaylor Baird would have the sense um, to push forward on um, climate action issues uh, that are surrounding us. We're already seeing across the globe the impacts of, um, you know, these climate change and what's happening across the globe. But right here in Lincoln, you might not be aware we've had some impacts as well. So I'll get into that a little bit. Um, in 2019, Mayor had actually commissioned a study. Um, she worked with a consultant group called Veritas, who specializes in the area of climate. And uh, this study was really to be specific to Lincoln's climate future and what specific risks we were gonna be facing in the future. Um, and what that study found. So I wanted to um, talk real briefly about resilience and what it means to all of us um, when we talk through what Resilient Lincoln and what this initiative is all about. So when we're looking at city resilience or community resilience, we're, we're talking about the capacity of social, economic, and environmental systems to cope with a hazardous, hazardous event, trend, or disturbance responding or reorganizing in ways that maintain systems essential function, identity and structure, while also maintaining the capacity for adaption, 
learning and transformation. And in a nutshell, this is about our ability to bounce back from really bad situations. Um, coronavirus is a perfect example of that. So in addition to um, having the ability to bounce back from something that is uh, a hazardous event, it's also our ability to maintain control of current systems that keep our community and our society functioning. But in addition to that, sometimes it's also this ability to adapt and evolve and even transform into something else. And we're seeing that in the way that we meet and gather these days through, through uh, platforms like Zoom. Uh, so there can be space for innovation, even when we're trying to be super resilient. So in this study, um, and you can find out all the details by reading the executive summary or the full draft if you want, um, but in the study, again, it was commissioned specifically for Lincoln to assess what kind of risks we'll be facing um, in the future, what we're sort of experiencing right now uh, as a result of climate change. Um, and one of the interesting things that was outlined was not just the risks, but also what our climate future might look like. Um, so in 2050, if we can all kind of think about that horizon of time, um, we might be experiencing um, warmer temperatures of two to five degrees. We might be experiencing 10 to 20 additional days with higher temperatures than 95 degrees. Um, we'll see an increase in water, um, I'm sorry, in winter and spring precipitation of 15 to 20 percent. And we'll see some more severity, some heavy precipitation and storms of 15 to 30 uh, percent by 2050. And in, in, in Nebraska, we might be thinking, well, that's great, you know, to have warmer temperatures and warmer climate. But where those um, temperature increases and the additional water um, make a difference is in our growing season and how it impacts. So it's having too much water when we don't need it and it's having too little water when we really do. Um, so those warmer temperatures impact plant growth, um, water supply levels, um, and summer irrigation demands. And so that's what we're really trying to assess for our area. In Lincoln in particular, with respect to those um, that kind of future climate scenario, what would be the, the risks? Well, flooding is one. We saw a huge flood uh, occur on the Platte River in 2019, and it took out our well field. Um, if you recall, we had to implement mandatory water restrictions. As a result, we had about 24 hours of water supply um, for our city in, in those days, and it was pretty scary um, mm -hmm. to, to think about not having any water supply at all and how to serve a city adequately. Uh, fortunately, um, we were able to maintain our systems and get them back online so that we didn't have to uh, suffer anymore. Um, but implementing those mandatory water restrictions made a huge difference in our community. Uh, if you remember, restaurants were serving from you know, paper plates and plastic spoons because we couldn't uh, have, uh, have them wash dishes to draw on our water supply. It was a really critical time for our community to come together. Uh, drought is another um, big risk uh, that could be in our future, but it's also been in our past. We had a similar 2012 drought that impacted our single source of water supply. So um, those levels in our water supply and the, come from the Platte River and in an aquifer. And our goal is always to make sure that Lincoln has adequate water supply to serve our community. But in April, I'm sorry, in August and September of 2012, uh, again, we had to implement mandatory water restrictions. And then the following years, we had to program additional wells. Uh, they're called horizontal wells to draw more groundwater into our system so that we wouldn't lose water supply. So this is nothing new to our community. We actually have uh, worked on resiliency projects um, in the past and will continue to do so as a result of both flooding and drought. Um, but what we're also seeing is uh, public health issues. You can see that with respect to COVID. Um, food supply has been 
an interesting thing to watch the risks associated with not having enough food at the grocery stores. Um, even toilet paper <laughs> was an issue to find. So um, these are all of the um, risks that have been associated with this study, just so we can understand how to prepare for them and mitigate them in the future. Um, I talked a little bit about, you know, what we're learning right now um, with respect to the pandemic. And it's, it's incredible how these kind of sudden shocks to the system really bring about enormous consequence. And sometimes, even though the pandemic is affecting all of us in some way, you can see its impact to the most vulnerable. People who you know, are impoverished, who have food insecurity, um, who have lack of transportation, lack of health care, they are really hurting right now. And you can see this sort of divide in how the pandemic affects some populations and some neighborhoods and how it affects others. So these disasters can have cascading effects. They can uh, have interruptions to the food supply. That's a real threat that we've learned about. Um, but there are also some unexpected benefits that we've seen. Um, again, this kind of increase in technology, the way that we're able to gather, allows us to telecommute. Um, everyone at the city always thought, oh boy, you know, how are we going to make it, this happen to do a telecommute policy? Um, are people going to really be as productive as they would if they were coming into an office? And the answer is, Yes, they are going to be productive, and they might even be more productive as a result of technology. Um, so we are actually seeing innovations, we're seeing adaptations, and people are evolving to the circumstances. Um, but one of the big things we've learned is how important social capital is. It's not just about resilient infrastructure, it's about resilient relationships, connections to the community with people like um, the Young Professionals Group, the Lincoln Chamber, like our nonprofit systems, like our government. It's really making sure that we stick together during these really tough times. I wanna talk a lot too about the intersections with um, this climate action plan and some socioeconomic trends that we're seeing in Lincoln and how this was studied and enveloped into the plan. Um, in Lincoln, I wanna give you some stats. In Lincoln, um, approximately 30% of households are at or in poverty. They're at or near poverty. Um, so we have about a third of people in Lincoln uh, suffering from poverty. Um, poverty rates in Lincoln are also not distributed evenly. Um, uh, um, high majority of those populations who are in poverty are African American, followed by Hispanics and Asians. And so we have some real vulnerabilities with respect to those populations. And what that raises for us is a real equity issue and environmental justice issues. Um, just to talk a little bit about food insecurity and, and um, access to good, fresh food, 13% uh, of residents in our county experience food insecurity. And so we just want to be mindful when we're facing risks, how can we mitigate uh, the uh, real disparaging impact to those vulnerable populations. So just wanted to quickly touch base on that um, and how that's built into this plan. Um, so environmental justice is a big part of this um, this plan, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income. I would also say age. I think young people are really important to consider uh, in, in the climate future that we are presenting ourselves with. So making sure that the implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies are fair to everyone. And here's another example. I just want to give you a quick illustration of how neighborhoods, uh, impoverished neighbor, neighborhoods are affected. These areas uh, indicate uh, different neighborhoods all across uh, our city, but the red and this kind of pink and orange areas, these indicate um, 
neighborhoods and populations that have a difficult time affording their electricity. Um, so keeping electricity uh, on um, the, in these low income areas are really hard because uh, the, they pay a higher rate per their um, median income. And so we've graphically tried to show people um, that these areas, people are having a hard time paying for electricity and they're also living in homes um, that aren't exactly um, efficient from, a, from a, a climate standpoint. And so they need the most help with respect to um, climate and greenhouse gas emissions and, and how to um, help create a home that uh, doesn't use as much electricity. What's also tough to, to really look at is the fact that these homes are also impacted by our floodplain. So this blue uh, hash mark indicates the 100 year floodplain, the light blue, and then where the darker areas are indicate a 500 year flood. Um, and so these, like the area of North Bottom, South Bottoms, they're very uh, crucial areas where people are already paying more in utility bills um, at the same time that they don't have as much income and they're impacted by flooding that, that could occur with heavier precipitation rates and severity in storms. So our real focus from the mayor's office and this administration is to say, where do we want to be working really intentionally um, in building more resilient infrastructure, more resilient social networks and programs to help the people who will need it most. So uh, I don't want to talk just all doom and gloom because it actually we've had a lot of success in Lincoln. Lincoln is a progressive city. It has been looking at sustainability and environmental initiatives for a very long time. Um, this particular plan is unique because it it specifically calls out Lincoln's climate risks in the future and how to specifically mitigate those risks. But we have always had a sense for environmental um, issues and impacts. And we have a list of things I won't go into detail about, but we, uh, you might even recognize some of these wonderful things that we've been doing to help mitigate our climate future. But these have been great um, programs and a, and a huge success. Um, so this vision that uh, Mayor has um, really sparked is super exciting. Um, this draft climate action plan again is out there for everyone's review and feedback and we'll talk a little bit about schedule later but the vision is really to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 relative to 2011 levels. Um, we also want to be resilient to the climate hazards we'll face in the future. And all of these strategic climate directions and climate resilience um, pieces will be integrated throughout city actions and ordinances. And so we're very committed to just making sure that we look at our comprehensive plan, our capital improvement plans, our policies and directives to consider uh, what the climate, our climate future could be. There are eight climate action areas that we are working in. So this is a very comprehensive approach to climate. Uh, first, transitioning to low carbon energy, and that's, that's all about greenhouse gas emissions. And if you hadn't heard, um, LES, the LES board just um, passed a really aggressive decarbonization goal. They are really trying to get to renewable energy um, they, they're at about 46% today and they want to continue to increase that amount. So their decarbonization goal is um, by 2040, they want to get to uh, net, de net carbon in, uh, decrease um, 100%. So they are really, really devoted to that. Uh, the devil is in the details and how they get there exactly, but there'll be more to come on that. Building a decarbonized and efficient transportation system, that's about investments in EVs, um, electric vehicles, um, moving our busing system, our transit system 
to electric, to um, other forms of fueling, alternative forms, uh, rather than fossil fuels. And then also encouraging um, multimodal uh, transportation, things like biking, and now we have scooters, um, and even walking. Aligning economic development goals with climate realities, improving protections for and with Lincoln residents, building a resilient local food system, maximizing natural climate solutions, reducing waste, and of course, communications, engaging our residents in co-creating a climate smart future. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, walk through this um, a little at a time, and give you examples of the types of initiatives and projects we're thinking about. I won't go into too much detail because I want to make sure we have lots of time at the end for questions. But in that first action area, transitioning to low carbon energy, um, one of the big technological things we need to do is conducting a, a carbon sink inventory. We need to understand how much land we have that can serve to sequester carbon. We also need to analyze carbon emissions of any key strategies that we select. Building a decarbonized and efficient transportation system. This is actually an image of the Hyperloop. I don't know if anybody's following it, but if we built a Hyperloop between Lincoln and Omaha, we would get to Omaha in five minutes. It's an incredible project that's being piloted uh, across the country. Um, but simple things like adopting a teleworking policy, strengthening public transit, and making sure to expand our bike and trail network to encourage multi-modes of transportation. Aligning economic development goals with climate realities. Um, again, talking about a connection between Lincoln and Omaha from our workforce development and to promote um, tourism standpoint, um, but also looking to invest more in renewables, which is what LES's board just has accomplished. Uh, improving protections for and with Lincoln residents. We certainly need to secure a second source of water supply. We draw all of our water from the Platte River, uh, from an aquifer under the Platte River. Um, and so again, we have experienced that 2012 drought resulting in mandatory water restrictions as well as the 2019 flood. So it's very important to talk about where we secure that second source, whether it's going all the way to the Missouri and building a pipeline to the Missouri or partnering with our Omaha uh, partners, MUD, um, to do an interconnect on water. Building a resilient local food system. I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but in Lincoln, we only have about three days of food supply in Lincoln um, from all of our grocery stores. And so the pandemic has really exposed that vulnerability. And what this means is that we really need to partner with um, community crops um, and, and our agricultural partners out in the county um, to make sure that we have access to fresh food, fresh local food, and, and sort of those farm to table concepts. So we're working very closely with those organizations to, to talk about what we can do to secure local food um, if we need it. Maximizing natural climate solutions. Of course, I'm a big advocate of our park system, and um, but really, the support of prairie restoration and protection of natural resources is is not only good from an aesthetic standpoint, um, but it's really good for um, carbon sequestration. The actual solution to cooling the planet is in the soil. Um, how we conduct agriculture, going to a more um, climate smart ag, including no-till practices, and investing in more biodiversity actually um, there are incredi there's incredible incredible body of science around how to care for soils and nurture soils in order to sequester more carbon that already exists in the atmosphere. So it's great that we want to reduce carbon emissions, but we also have to talk about how to sequester legacy carbon that's already in the atmosphere. And you do that with um, soils. Um, Reduce, reducing waste, um, getting away from sort of these single-use plastics where we can, uh, recycling as much as possible, and the city sort of adopting some green purchasing policies. So we're, 
we're talking through ways that we can really invest in reducing waste. And then finally, engaging residents and co-creating a climate smart future. Um, it's talking to groups like you uh, and getting the word out about this climate action plan using um, social media to talk about it and incorporating these considerations into our city uh, planning documents, our master plans, our comprehensive plans, our long-range transportation plans, our budgets, etc. Um, and continuing to engage residents and businesses who are most impacted by these climate-related risks. Our schedule, we actually want to take the Climate Action Plan, which is in draft form today, we want to take it to City Council and have them adopt the plan next spring. So right now our team is working on prioritizing key initiatives. We'd like to get to a list of about 10 to 20 key initiatives that we can focus on and fund while we're doing community engagement. We have some technical research to do around those key initiatives to, to make sure that what we're working on are the right things for Lincoln and also uh, actually result in more resiliency as well as greenhouse gas emissions. So we want to work on the most important things first. Um, City Council adoption will follow in the spring. We're thinking of um, the month of March. And then uh, we would kick off implementation by Earth Day of 2021. So before I stop talking and start to take questions, what I'd love to do is actually introduce you to my, my friend, Cohagen Wilkinson. He's the co-founder and CEO of the Carbon Emissions Project. And this is where that intersection between what I'm doing at the mayor's office and what people in our community are doing, how we can work together to shape our climate future. So I'm gonna stop share and we'll hear from Cohagen. Yeah, thanks, Mickey. It's a it's quite the introduction. Um, so my name is Cohagen Wilkinson. I uh, I'm a fractional executive, which means I I lead uh, multiple different organizations. Uh, one of the organizations that is uh, nearest and dearest to my heart is one that that me and uh, a good friend and business partner of mine founded uh, about a year ago called the Carbon Emissions Project. Uh, and where this came from, um, as long as I've known Clay, and we go back to middle school. Uh, I can always remember Clay saying, uh, uh, "Someday I'm going to be a billionaire, and I'm going to I'm going to use all that money to to solve climate change." And I said, "Yeah, yeah, okay, Clay. Uh, like any middle school kid, <laughs> it's all bluster." Uh, but then he went on to found a uh, relatively successful software company, and I started paying more attention to him. Uh, but Clay and I uh, have started to realize that we can't wait uh, until we're 50, 60, 70, and we've got massive amounts of, of resources to throw at the problem. We have to do something now because we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so, so about a year ago, we founded the, the Carbon Emissions Project. Uh, and our idea at the time, which uh, turned out to be a really terrible idea, but our idea at the time was to pull together uh, multidisciplinary experts from all across academia and industry for uh, this big event we were going to call the Climate Forum, where we put people, really smart people, in small groups uh, for, for three days and had them ideate on novel solutions to, to climate change, just to come up with whatever ideas they could, thinking that, well, uh, if we get enough ideas, surely one of them is gonna be interesting and novel, and then we can take that idea and then go uh, develop funding around it and, and uh, so on and so such. We, we never got this thing off the ground because uh, it was too hard to pull uh, the, the caliber of experts that we wanted into a physical place for three days. Uh, we realized that was just too much of an ask. So we started doing it online. We called it the Climate Forum. Uh, we met every couple of weeks and we got the smartest people we could find in a room to discuss climate change topics. Uh, and we ended up getting two ideas out of those, those Zoom sessions before Zoom was cool. Uh, and uh, the, the two ideas that we went with were uh, creating a carbon, an open source carbon calculator and creating a flux map. And I'll explain what both are. So the last year or so, we have been uh, recruiting volunteers to help us uh, contribute toward these two efforts, uh, which are ideally things that are 
put together from volunteers have a, uh, and open sourced to the to the entire world so that anybody who wants to take this uh, product that we've developed and build a business around it or research it further uh, or simply leverage it on a governmental scale can do so. So uh, the two projects that that we've been working on are the the carbon calculator, uh, which is basically built around the premise that if you wanted to go and calculate your uh, carbon footprint or your product's carbon footprint or your company's carbon footprint, uh, it costs a, a not insignificant amount of money to be able to, to perform that calculation, especially if you want to be really accurate. A lot of the, the databases that are used to perform these calculations are behind paywalls. So we've been working uh, in partnership with a group out of MIT uh, over the last year or so to put this open source carbon calculator together. Uh, we've got it working in, in a beta form right now, which is really exciting. Uh, and the next steps are to kind of uh, productize it a bit more so we could put it on a website and, and allow people to use it. The other thing we're working on uh, is a carbon flux map, which basically is a weather map for uh, carbon emissions or sinks. So you would be able to look at the map and graphically see where carbon is being <laughs> absorbed and where it's being emitted. Uh, we think that we can build this, uh, at least in our, our, our beta stage, to about a kilometer of resolution and increase it from there. And the way we're doing that are, is there are these uh, I'm going to nerd out here a little bit. There are these uh, carbon flux towers that a company here in, Ly in Lincoln Lycor makes, which are basically just uh, big badass sensor things that you can stick on the top of a, a metal tower that uh, measure within about a kilometer of space uh, the, the carbon movement, whether it's moving sideways or up or down, and the net difference between, uh, between those two things. So if you placed one of these towers over a field or a forest, you'd probably see carbon sinking into the, the ground. Uh, if, if you placed it in a city, uh, like on O Street here at 14th and O, where I live, uh, you'd probably see carbon being emitted by the, the traffic and uh, et cetera. So uh, the the impact of a tool like this would be relatively significant because uh, governments, uh, even like Lincoln, could hold themselves accountable toward hitting certain goals. Uh, if, if the United States were in the Paris Accord uh, still, uh, we would be able to use a tool like this to understand if we're hitting the, the metrics that, that we say we're going to. Uh, companies could use it to track uh, company emission performance. If an oil company has certain targets that they want to hit, they could use this to, to track. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't explain. The, the, the towers are the, the source truth, right? And then we're using satellite data uh, from NASA and the European Space Agency uh, that have global coverage down to about 500 meters resolution to train the satellite data against the ground truth that we have from the flex towers. Uh, so the, the data from the satellites is relatively inaccurate, but if, if, if you have enough of these towers to be able to, to use as a source of truth, you can then train the data. Uh, so anyway, so there are all these cool applications of being able to use a map like this. We even think Wall Street would be interested uh, because you could see uh, leading indicators of certain industrial performance, uh, for example. Um, so that's the other project we're working on. Uh, we've had a couple of other ones, and I'll, I'll share just, just briefly uh, that it's, it's interesting that the, the biggest challenge that we've had so far in our, our projects is fighting uh, consumer apathy. People either don't know that climate change is this this tremendously impactful, dangerous problem that we as a, as, a, as humanity face, or they don't care enough to change their behavior. Um, there's this trend in in market research where there's a there's a disconnect between uh, reported behavior and and real behavior. So someone might say, uh, "Yeah, if if I had the chance to." Uh, to push a button on the gas uh, gas dispenser at the, the gas station uh, and and pay an extra five cents a gallon to completely offset my carbon footprint, of course I do that. But then when they're presented with the actual option to do so at a real gas station, less than 5% of the people who said that they would actually push the button and spend the extra money. Uh, and this is this is a trend that 
that it, that is far outside of the the gasoline industry. We we see it just about everywhere that people uh, are not willing to make purchase decisions that are in alignment with their values. Uh, they're 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 wanting to spend to to save money, which I I think could go back to the whole trend of of uh, millennials making significantly less than the generations before us. But that's an entirely different topic. Um, so we're trying to fight this this trend of 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 uh, apathy and dis or un in information un uninformedness uh, is kind of the, the biggest thing that we face, and that's not really Clay and Mai's area of expertise. We're more on the the computer science uh, project management side of things. But uh, oh, okay, my Amazon Echo wants to chime in here. Uh, but we're we're interested in in trying to f find solutions to problems like this. We're we're looking for projects that we can throw our volunteer weight behind. Uh, the the biggest things that I would like to impress upon this group today is that uh, you don't you don't have to to get the the millions or billions of dollars to be able to make an impact. You you can start a project yourself with volunteers or friends uh, to simply make a small change in, in your immediate sphere of influence. Uh, little things add up to be big things. Um, so start your own project, whether that's uh, uh, encouraging people to bring reusable bags to the store. It, it's silly, but little things like that do add up to make a difference. Uh, you can do big computer science projects like we do. And by the way, if, if anyone out there wants to get involved, uh, the carbonemissionsproject.com, it's carbonemissionsproject.com, uh, has a volunteer interest form. Uh, send it to people who you think might be interested in pitching in with us. Uh, and that's, that's my presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, Mickey. So uh, I think Mickey and I will open it up for questions. Uh, and maybe we can just have a discussion around um, uh, general questions about the city's plan, uh, ideas for things that we as young leaders in Lincoln can be contributing toward to make a difference. Uh, I'd be interested in all of it. Great. Thank you, Kohagen. I am working on unmuting you um, all. Um, or you can throw any questions that you may have in the chat or the q and A. I'm almost done with the list. Yeah, I'll just kind of chime in. There's been a couple of really good questions um, already thrown out there. So hopefully you guys are um, seeing those and I've been trying to uh, answer as I go there and rapid fire typing, but um, these are really good, good questions coming from everyone. Kohagen, do you mind dropping in the chat your link to your... Um, sure, yeah. I, uh, I just typed it out and it obviously didn't work. <laughs> I, think it, I think it gets mad when you don't put the www dot. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and oops, I sent that to the to Lincoln Chamber, not to everybody. Here we go. Let me try again. Uh, you'd think as a computer scientist, we'd be able to figure that out, but uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty difficult. Hi, Marilyn. Nice to see you. Yeah, Marilyn went to high school with me and Clay. Oh, great. It's a small world. Oh, that's cool. There we go. All right. It looks like Akriti has a question. Um, what is your advice for helping implement organization-wide climate change at our company? Mm. Um, I, I would just start with, um, you know, kind of a planning, like developing a strategic plan. Um, and what that does, if you can set forth a vision with your company, um, maybe if you have it sponsored by the president of that company, you can talk to them about initiating a conversation that can turn in, into some sort of planning processes um, with through a small working group, if you will, who care about these issues. Um, a lot of times it's, it's tough to just start with the initiatives un unless you have um, that global vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And so when you 
start with the end game in mind, with the end in mind. It's just, it's a lot easier to have a target in which to um, strive toward, uh, particularly when you're trying to get buy-in from lots of people to participate. Let's say you wanted to lift up a big recycling initiative at your company. Well, it helps if you start with some goals um, and a vision for uh, why that would motivate people to do it. Um, so getting some people who are like-minded to talk about it and think about it and start sort of strategically planning um, toward that vision and that um, those particular goals uh, is a nice way to get kind of company buy-in. So that's how I would, I would start. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add uh, is uh, one of the methods that I found to be most effective in uh, encouraging my clients to think more critically about what, what we can be doing uh, as organizations is what is the cost of not preparing for, for a future in which the climate degrades significantly. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can approach climate change uh, strategy or climate change mitigation strategy by looking at it from the perspective of a, of a risk assessment uh, team. So if you look and see uh, what, what would the impact be of, of, of a significant flood in Lincoln on our company? What would the impact be of uh, food scarcity uh, on our employees? What uh, and what steps can we be taking as an organization to remediate some of the risk associated with climate change from purely from a cost perspective? I find that that approaching things from a a uh, reducing risk of incurring significant costs is, is a language that uh, resonates well with, with business owners. For sure. And I think even um, efficiency, you know, finding ways to, to talk about um, projects that where you're investing in LEDs and investing in insulation, um, prioritizing uh, parking for employees that are driving hybrid vehicles or EVs. I mean, those are things and ideas that um, can be, you know, um, really beneficial from an employment standpoint. And I think especially young people are looking for employers who have that purpose in mind. And so uh, great advice, Cohagen. Great. Yeah, what, one of the translate it to cost. <laughs> one of the idea on that note, yeah. one of the ideas that Clay, Clay and I have been profitizing is this idea of um, asking your insurance company what the, what what extra they're charging uh, or what the what what the amount is that they're charging you uh, because of climate risk and what what some what some improvements could be made to your your organization or your facilities that would reduce that risk in a way that would save you insurance cost. Uh, so if you looked at it from that perspective, you, you could make the, the argument for making uh, improvements to your operations or your facilities uh, in a cost-saving measure that would then have a, a net benefit on the environment. Yeah. Go ahead, and there's a question here about um, from David. Do you see that one? What types of info on carbon emissions? I don't know if you... Yeah. Our, yeah. Like our Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department puts out carbon emission data for Lincoln and Lancaster County. Uh, certainly EPA puts out information um, from a federal and state standpoint, but I didn't know if you had any specific references to provide. Yeah, that's that's not something I'm, I'm deeply familiar with. Uh, Mickey, do you know where the city gets its its carbon emissions data, how that's generated? Yeah. And we kind of included it in the plan. It's, it's reported through... Um, let me think about the acronym that's used, the Southwest Power Pool, SPP. Um, there are sort of widgets that measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, associated gotcha. So it's, it's mostly relying on energy generation sources. Yeah, right. That's one part. And then um, the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department has sort of G GHG uh, widgets gotcha. to, to measure um, our own, but the, you know, EPA, uh, and they have to report those uh, levels to EPA every year. So it is regulated. Um, we are in a, in a, in a, from a air quality standpoint, we are in a, in a non-attainment, they call it non-attainment uh, climate area. We have good, mm. good quality air, except when Kansas sets everything on fire. <laughs> <sighs> 
we always yeah have to experience that but um but i don't know if you have to if you're just relying on those regulatory sources for your carbon emissions data that's where we get it um, there's another one about food supply we did not do a study or peer review on food supply in other areas and it is a shocking number um and you know we it that could be a a nice to get a nice understanding of um even what our neighbor cities are doing you know grand island and omaha and york um, but it is rather terrifying to think that if interstate 80 commercial traffic couldn't you know come into town in some way to deliver uh the food that we um, rely upon you know, we would have to rely on more local sources of food. Um, and one of the really interesting and fascinating things the city is looking at is the city actually owns a lot of land, acreages of land uh, in support of our utilities. Um, and we have a farm manager who is currently managing all those properties for us. So while we want that property for purposes of um, uh, utility infrastructure underground, it's great for, um, you know, haying or row crop production, et cetera, and it, and it generates a little, uh, little bit of revenue for the city. So now we're going to be looking at putting out a um, competitive bid to have no-till practices, to have biodiverse um, crops, um, and to make sure that we're taking care of the health of that soil to to then do a calculation of how much carbon we can sequester. We'll work with community crops on that. So it's a really exciting thing that can help the initiative and to get to net um, that net number of 80% by 2050. While providing food locally, <laughs> I should say that. Awesome. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, Sarah wants to know, will this plan involve working with the university to get them on board with these citywide goals? Oh, that's a great question. And I love when you begin to think about our strategic partners and UNL is definitely one. Um, UNL just released their sustainability, uh, UNL sustainability plan. Um, and a lot of their initiatives do align with our goals. Um, it's not apples to apples per se. They do, they do their strategic planning a little differently. Um, they have obviously different considerations, but they are very serious about taking steps um, in the space of sustainable, having sustainability in the future. Um, it's not exactly a climate action plan, but they have been partnering with us. We, we meet on a monthly basis to talk about our initiatives and how to work together. One of those initiatives on, you know, co-creating uh, Climate Smart Future is utilizing students on particular initiatives that the city would be involved in. And so um, UNL will be really a big partner. LPS is another partner. SCCC is another partner. Um, so we're working with our other institutions in, in town to, to really work together on this because it is a, a system. Um, it's, it takes really all of us. Great question. Oh, uh, there's one about water supply here. What types of factors are being considered with looking at redundant water supplies for Lincoln? Cost is huge. So we have an estimated cost to go to the Missouri, a 60 mile pipe from Lincoln to the Missouri River would cost about, uh, and a facility uh, off the Missouri would cost about $1.5 billion. So it's huge. I feel like whenever I say that amount, I always feel like that guy, you know, on Austin, what's that movie? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but $1.5 billion to go to the Missouri, which is super expensive. If we partner with MUD, um, which is the service provider to Omaha and the, and the area around it, then we can cut that cost in half. So that's a huge uh, consideration. Um, and then the second consideration is um, reliability. We would want to make sure whatever connection we provided, um, because the engineering is there, we can, we can engineer it, uh, we can staff it, all that, but we would want to make sure that there weren't any um, risks in the future um, 
from piping water from the Missouri and, and going that way, that, that long path toward Lincoln, um, that we wouldn't have any problems in the future. We have another one in the Q&A. In addition to reducing single-use plastics, will composting be considered in the waste reduction plan for the city? Yes, it is. And one of Mayor's most favorite um, concepts that other cities have a, a accomplished is a, a community compost uh, site. Um, we have some real success um, with respect to yard waste version. Um, we have figured out how to use land at the, the landfill to um, uh, work out a, a way to decompose uh, yard waste into this incredible um, uh, soil amenity and compost. But with respect to all kinds of waste that's generated in households, um, she, she would really like to see a community-based compost uh, site for the city. So uh, currently, right now, there's a solid waste management plan process underway, and they are considering how to um, spearhead that in initiative and what it would cost. It's a great one. I see here in the chat another great um, question. Do we have any available data yet to see what, if any, impact the pandemic has had on local carbon emissions? We will. Um, that, again, is being studied by the health department. Of course, they're the same group that is working on the pandemic, um, but there's a three-year cycle that they evaluate carbon emissions by. and so. Um, we're due for some some data from them next year. So yeah, we'll see what what how how that impacted carbon emissions in Lincoln and Lancaster County. Hey guys, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Mickey, I saw that the Journal Star when they covered this. Um, when they covered the draft climate action plan, they mentioned um, that the plan included a recommendation to eliminate gas stoves. And a lot of people responded and felt like that was government overreach or an unnecessary expense. Can you talk a little bit about the different recommendations in the plan and how um, they will be implemented or like what you're using people's feedback for? Yeah, so um, I know people got pretty excited about that. Um, there are over 350 what are called strategies in the plan. They are ideas um, in which to reach these goals. So um, it's, it's during this time, it's really on um, the city to actually prioritize what we think are the wildly important initiatives to work on. Um, so uh, whether we would regulate, you know, kind of individual choices about stoves. That might be a nice idea to reach a goal, but it's not necessarily that the city will choose to adopt it in the finalized plan. Um, and more than likely, that would be some, something that would be long range because we have so many other higher priorities uh, like, um, you know, getting LES to more renewable sources of energy, um, working on the single, uh, this kind of single source of water supply and getting to the second source, working on more flood plain um, resiliency in neighborhoods. So more than likely what will happen is those key initiatives will pick between 10 and 20 to work on and fund um, won't include those kinds of ideas that are more about personal choices. We'll encourage personal choices. Um, but certainly regulating those personal choices won't be something that um, we pursue year one for sure. <laughs> so there's just so many other bigger priorities um, that have greater gains to work on. So I hope that makes sense in, in that answer. That's super helpful. Thank you. So you going forward when people kind of have the chance to review your plan and give feedback, what, what kind of feedback are you looking for or what are you kind of encouraging people to take away? Great. So the feedback I'm, I'd be looking for are additional ideas that people might have that aren't included in the plan, 
any general questions about um, the science or data or the initiatives themselves. We're open to feedback on all of those things. If there's anything you really hate in the plan, we'd love to hear back. I mean, you know, we, um, if you think we're going the wrong direction, so it's really, it runs the gamut. Um, but especially if, you, if you're not seeing something that you think is really important to address, uh, certainly we'd want to give an opportunity to, to address those things. Um, yeah. Awesome. And I would say we, we are taking public feedback until the beginning of March. Thank you. Yes, great. Um, there's one on, are there plans to increase infrastructure for electric vehicles? Would be cool if all the meters downtown could also serve. Oh, that is a great idea. Um, Eric, um, there are plans to uh, invest in EVs for city fleet and um, not only to um, work on consolidating city fleet, but also to move from fossil fuel reliance to uh, electric vehicles uh, from a city standpoint, including transit buses. Uh, we've been really intentional about that. Um, and to invest in more charging stations downtown. And I'll talk to the parking director about meters and charging stations. That's a very good idea. <laughs> I just don't know if the um, technology exists, but what a great idea. And then since carbon levels are a global problem, are there considerations of partnering with other regions, communities who might be able to reduce carbon levels more easily, cheaply? Um, you know, there's a huge opportunity here to work and partner with our agricultural community on, again, no-till practices in Nebraska. Um, it is really touchy. There is some investment on the front end. Um, but it also means that we can talk about reduction in chemical use um, in, in creating those crops. Um, the partnership would probably be with an outfit called USDA or the NRCS, where they are really um, focused on soil health and already uh, working with co-ops and, and producers um, on these practices. And City of Lincoln would love to be a leader in that space with those um, those folks and and they also are sort of regionally represented so they you know uh, Kansas Iowa Nebraska Colorado that kind of thing so we think that might be the best approach um, Awesome, Mickey and Cohagen, thank you so much for joining us. I think we're, we're just a little bit over time, oh, yeah. um, but I will uh, I will absolutely send out contact information um, to everyone that attended. Uh, for everyone that is attending, this is recorded, um, so we will be putting it on our website if you want to share it with anyone else. Um, and then I will also go ahead and resend when I send you their contact information. I'll resend uh, kind of those resources and things that we. Um, had provided at the very um, beginning with registration. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us. Um, Kayla, do we have any other cool events coming up? We do. Um, we have some really <laughs> awesome events. Thank you, Maraid. Uh, we have our um, Fizz the Season, which is a great event coming up next Thursday. Um, you will need to register by the end of day on Monday to do that with us. We're partnering with The Mill and doing a really fun um, at-home we're gonna uh, taste four different drinks. We're gonna start out with a bubbly cocktail and end with a Prosecco, and they're gonna pair those um, with some uh, different food choices for us. We're going to virtually go through why those pairings work um, with their chefs. It's gonna be a super fun night. That's our holiday celebration. And then we had to end the year with some more competition. So we have a trivia, um, another trivia game coming up. Um, here, I believe it's on the 20th, um, it's a Sunday, but you can check out all of our events um, on the website. They're all up and you can register there. Um, otherwise, we hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you again, Cohagen and Mickey for joining thank us. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Awesome.